As soon as COVID-19 restrictions started lifting, people started getting married again. But having had to wait or getting married older, the betrothed had given some thought about what getting married means. Perhaps they've been following this podcast and paid attention to the issues that can arise on separation or read the comments of other participants. Perhaps they have gotten my book to understand how family law works. But people who are getting married now are getting married smarter and using marriage contracts to avoid surprises if they separate. From property division to support to parenting issues, in this episode of the Ontario Family Law Podcast, I will look at what you can and cannot do with a marriage contract. I'm John Schumann, a certified specialist in Family Law Ontario. I'm also a mediator, arbitrator, and collaborative lawyer. This podcast is a companion to my book, Guide to the Basics of Ontario Family Law, which is available on the iBookstore, Amazon, Kobo, and in fine bookstores. Whether it's people who are getting married and want to protect one or more assets, or protect a gift from parents, or their income, or want to avoid losing half of a house after a short marriage, or people who are trying to save their marriage because one spouse is engaging in some risky financial adventures, marriage contracts are not that uncommon. If you have heard a little bit about family law, then you may know that the problems you want to avoid. If you don't know, then you may want to speak to a family lawyer to know what you are getting into before you get married or start living with somebody else. You can have a marriage contract if you are getting married. You can have a cohabitation agreement if you are going to live common law. And you can sign those contracts at any time, not just before you get married or start living together. Although often it is easier to work these things out before getting married or starting to live together. And if there are serious problems working out the terms of the contract, that can give an indication that there might be some other problems that will be creeping up during the relationship. Also, cohabitation agreements automatically become marriage contracts if a common law couple decides to get married, unless the contract states otherwise. So what can marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements do to allow couples to make precise plans for their future? Marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements can set out how the spouses will organize their affairs while they are living together, when they separate, or both. There are limits on what matters can be included in a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement. However, Ontario's Family Law Act does allow couples to have terms covering several matters. First, couples can have terms regarding ownership in or division of property. This includes excluding certain assets or liabilities from equalization, such as family businesses or gifts from others, or opting out of the equalization process altogether. It could also limit each partner's right to make other types of claims against each other's property, such as the claims for joint family venture or other trust claims that are designed to get around legal title. The agreement can require, require that property, other than a matrimonial home, be sold on separation or another time. Where property is not sold, the agreement can set out how and when that property will be valued if the value is to be shared. It can also set out who will own what during the marriage. A very common marriage contract is to get around the provisions of the Family Law Act that says a spouse has to share all the value in a matrimonial home that he or she brought into the marriage if that same property is the matrimonial home on the date of separation. This means spouses can lose half the value in their houses after only a short marriage. A marriage contract can protect that equity and avoid a situation where a spouse feels that he or she cannot afford to allow the family to move into the house that he or she had before. The marriage contract can also have terms that allow a spouse's parents to contribute to a down payment on a matrimonial home without worrying that their son or daughter-in-law will get half of that money. Some parents insist on marriage contracts before making such gifts. The second issue that couples can address with a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement is spousal support. The parties can tell exactly what support will be paid between them when they separate or specify that no support will be paid. Although to be enforceable, the agreement must make it clear that a couple has contemplated all the possible future circumstances and still agree that in any of those circumstances, the spousal support terms are still fair. Judges rarely think that spousal support releases are fair when there are children of the marriage. The parties can also set out how they will address finances and pay for things 
during their relationship. It is technically possible to address child support in a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement, but those terms are often not practical. The agreement must be reasonable having regard to the child support guidelines. Additionally, if the matter of child support makes it before a court, the court must order child support in accordance with the child support guidelines. The court can only follow the terms of the marriage contract or cohabitation agreement if those terms benefit the child more than the child support guidelines. Further, where the support payer is receiving social assistance, employment insurance, Canada pension benefits, or similar public benefits, this exception does not apply. Drafting an agreement for child support, other than in accordance with the child support guidelines, is a risky and tricky process that requires competent family lawyers to be involved. Another tricky area that marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements can cover is the right to direct the education and moral training of any children of the relationship, but not decision-making responsibility or parenting time after separation. However, when determining a matter respecting the education, moral training, parenting time, or decision-making responsibilities for a child, a judge may disregard any provision of a domestic contract addressing those issues where he or she feels that doing so is in the best interest of the child. So while these terms are illegal and they may be considered by a judge, they are not automatically enforceable. The Family Law Act also allows marriage contracts or cohabitation agreements to cover other issues in settlement of the couple's affairs as long as they are not otherwise illegal. For example, a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement can include provisions that the parties abide by the terms of a shareholder's agreement for a business, that a spouse will resign from a family business on separation, or that the parties will designate a certain property as a matrimonial home, which can be important for reasons I will come to shortly. It is possible to include other terms as long as they are not illegal. Speak to a family lawyer to determine whether the terms you want would be permitted. Ontario's Family Law Act specifically prohibits four types of terms from being included in marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements. In addition, the Income Tax Act does not consider support arrangements in marriage contracts or separation agreements. As a result, marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements cannot include the following types of terms. First, marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements cannot set parenting terms either with respect to decision-making responsibilities or parenting time. Although the law does allow marriage contracts to have terms in relation to, to moral upbringing and education, judges always have the right to make the parenting time and decision-making de responsibility decisions that they feel is in the child's best interest regardless of the agreement between the parties. Second, marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements cannot restrict either married spouse's right to be in possession of matrimonial homes. On separation, married spouses have an equal right to stay in matrimonial homes. As we discussed in previous episodes, there can be more than one matrimonial home. A ma marriage contract cannot contain terms that require one spouse to leave a matrimonial home. It also cannot authorize one spouse to sell, mortgage, or otherwise encumber, or otherwise dispose of a matrimonial home before the spouses are divorced unless they sign a separation agreement addressing the matrimonial home or a court permits it by way of an order. But if the spouses formally designate one property as a matrimonial home, as I mentioned earlier, there are other homes that will not be matrimonial homes and then they are exempt from these restrictions. So requiring in a marriage contract that one home be designated as a matrimonial home can be very important. Only married spouses can have matrimonial homes, so this restriction does not apply to cohabitation agreements unless the parties marry while the agreement is still in effect. Third, a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement cannot contain provisions for child support that benefit the child less than the child support guidelines. As I mentioned before, if the matter of child support goes before an Ontario court, the judge will make an order in accordance with the child support guidelines unless the judge feels the terms of the agreement are reasonable in light of those guidelines. A marriage contract or cohabitation agreement cannot require the parties to resolve any issue arising from the breakdown of the relationship by way of arbitration. The Family Law Act does not allow parties to agree to resolve a family law dispute by way of arbitration until after the dispute has arisen. However, the changes to the Family Law Act that came into force in 2021 require the parties to consider alternative dispute resolution options, which include arbitration, before going to court. So a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement cannot require parties to arbitrate issues, but the law requires them to consider it. I have discussed the benefits of ADR, including arbitration, in previous episodes. Check out the links in the description. 
The terms of a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement do not result in spousal support payments that are deductible to the support payer and taxable to the support recipient while the parties are still living at the same residence. For support payments to be recognized under the Income Tax Act, one separated spouse must make the payments to the other separated spouse pursuant to a written separation agreement or a court order. People who are living together cannot agree that one will pay support to the other to shift the tax burden to the person who pays tax at the lower rate. Finally, there are specific laws against the clauses that require chastity in domestic contracts, and there are several other contract terms that are not allowed in any type of contract in Ontario. Loving couples almost certainly will not be trying to put those types of terms into a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement, but meeting with lawyers will make sure that such terms do not go into a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement. Marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements are forward-looking documents. They address how the parties want to organize their affairs in the future. It is possible that in the future the Ontario government will add more restrictions on what parties can include in marriage contracts or cohabitation agreements. It is also possible that those new restrictions will be applied to existing marriage contract and cohabitation agreements, which could invalidate some of the terms in those existing contracts and agreements. It is not possible to protect a contract from the legislature passing a law making that contract invalid. People signing marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements have to be aware of and accept that risk. Anyone signing a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement must also understand that if their contract contains only terms that are allowed, those terms might still not be enforced if they do not follow the rules governing the creation of those contracts. In previous episodes, I have gone over the rules that must be strictly followed for a court to enforce any domestic contract. It is critically important that you get the assistance of a good family law lawyer to make sure that your marriage contract or cohabitation agreement will survive a court challenge later if your spouse does not like how the terms of the contract are working out for them. Still, marriage contracts and cohabitation agreements represent an excellent way for couples to set out precisely what their relationship means and what some of their rights are during it. But getting a valid marriage contract and ensuring you get the most out of it requires that you discuss the matter with a good family law lawyer. If you need some more general family law guidance, or you need to understand Ontario family law better so that you can make better decisions. If you need to know the best options for arranging your affairs during your relationship or after separation, or if you need some tips for how best to make these types of difficult decisions, get a copy of my book, Guide to the Basics of Ontario Family Law. You can access it immediately on the iBookstore on Amazon for the Kindle version, or you can download it for Kobo. Amazon can deliver the paperback version directly to your doorstep. You can also get a lot more Ontario family law information on www.schumanlaw.ca. Not only there are hundreds of pages of family law information and links, but there are links to get my book and there are links to reach my office to meet with either me or one of my colleagues. You can also call 416-446-5847 to make an appointment. Because it's always best to get a lawyer who can give you specific advice that is specific to your situation. In addition to my website, keep up to date on family and children's law issues by liking my Facebook page, following me on Twitter at, at @humanfamilylaw, and finding me on LinkedIn. Of course, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to keep up to date. You can also get the audio version of the Ontario Family Law Podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and many more. They're also available at www.humanlaw.ca. Thanks for participating in this podcast. We will get together again soon.